everyone, and welcome back to the Red Beard Outdoors podcast. I have an amazing guest today, Charles Whitman from Howl. And you guys may have heard of Howl in the past. It is something that uh, it's a great community of individuals that are doing work in the political sphere and raising awareness to many opportunities that we, we need to take advantage of and or defend uh, as far as our rights and privileges of hunting and conservation. So, uh, Charles, who are you and what is Howl? Yeah, my name is uh, Charles Whitwam. I'm the president and founder of Howl for Wildlife. And Howl for Wildlife is a it's an organization, a platform. I think it's more of a community of connecting people to the issues. Um, we basically provide the tools, kind of pull the curtain on how to get involved, who to contact. We take all those roadblocks out. So you as a sportsman or anybody really can take effective action, um, make testimony, whatever it is, uh, to the, to the proper people, you know, relevant to what the issue is. It's like you've done this before. Very concise, awesome explanation. I think you kind of nailed it right there on the head. That's a great, great explanation of what the community is. I love that you say community because it, it isn't just, you know, a group of individuals that are attacking these, the things that need to be uh, addressed. It's you really have brought in a bunch of people uh, and allow people such as myself to contribute in various ways. Um, so I guess what, let's just jump right into it. what got you to start? How, why did you want to, to start this community? I was involved in a, in 2018, I was involved in a bill that had something to do with wild pig hunting. Uh, but there was some, uh, man, what do I call it? Uh, cause I'm not a hundred percent sure of what happened, but I know of, I'm a hundred percent sure of, of what it looked like, but there was a pro hunt. It was advertised as a pro hunting bill. However, a paragraph in there, which was pretty sneakily worded, uh, was, was put in by the humane society of the United States in, in California. And I believe it's because it was a, a, a political move, if you will, where, okay, the humane society won't speak up. They'll remain neutral on this bill if they get a little bit to go their way in this pro hunting bill that was pushed by hunting organizations, um, as, as pro, uh, I somehow, I can't explain to you how this is happening. It's just things just come across my way. And I found myself in this space. So anyways, I kind of uncovered that and got people involved, got that bill killed completely a grassroots effort and sort of just again, pulling the curtain <laughs> on the whole situation. And then in 2021, there was a bill and this was the big, this was the big catalyst. There was a bill in 2021 by a Senator in in California sponsored of course by humane society and all that to basically take bear hunting away from california um i was i was um i basically organized a grassroots effort to get people to speak up about this quickly and hey here's all the right people you should contact it's not your legislator it's not your congressman because they have nothing to do with this bill there's a committee that's hearing it and then there's a sponsoring senator they need to be overrun right now with your voice, with your messages. So we had all the phone numbers. We had some emails set up. We had um, a uh, change.org petition, which I really don't know if that's effective or not, but I at least had it going to the right people <laughs> instead of just a name with petitions that don't go anywhere. And in five days, that entire bill from the time it was introduced, it was killed. There was so much noise. It was like to the tune of 27,000 people. Um, or more. I mean, that's just who I know that I could count who, who actually took an action right now. This is before how for wildlife, but what that told me was there's something missing in the hunting industry. And I think it was community. And I think it was, you know, it doesn't matter what org you're with or who does it or whatnot people out there. If you give them the right Avenue, they're hungry to get involved and they wanted to get involved in this. This was a big issue. That bill got killed. So uh, 
I remember the, the first guy who called me, uh, J.R. Young, actually, he, I, I didn't know the bill was killed. He, he called me and he said, the bill's dead. Like unbelievable. This was crazy. So basically at that second, I said, I need the, I need to work on organizing this. I need a website that essentially does this, what we did with that bill. Um, but in a more organized fashion and we, where we can keep on top of different issues that we can get involved in. And that, that's basically where that started. And then for the next year, I worked on how to do it, basically software and, and just, um, yeah, figuring out all kinds of stuff. And about a year later, uh, January 11th, 2022, uh, it went live. We launched it. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, you know, and, and that's a great story there. The fact that, you know, you put work in and then after putting the work in, you saw the results and it, it kind of sounds like you might've been even a little surprised that it worked, uh, when it, when it worked. But, uh, the fact that, you know, again, you, you saw a problem, you saw an issue and you saw that you wanted to combine what, no matter what organization you were coming from, uh, this ability to actually put action to these words everyone all hunters that i know of get upset about certain bills or certain things being passed or you know there's something going on right now in utah where uh, they're trying to say they're trying to call uh, mountain lions varmints basically i mean i know there's other fancy wording that they put yeah. into that but but you know people that aren't hunters they're like oh this is something hunters want and i'm like no it's not we want management we don't want you know <laughs> things to be eradicated and so and that's just something that's close to home here. But there's so many things that you guys have been involved in. And I've kind of been watching as you guys have grown. Uh, and I, I love that you are, you're not necessarily pushing anything other than getting a community together and, and uh, conservation. You want the best for the hunter. You want the best for the animals. Uh, you're not anti hunting or, or solo pro hunting. You are, you're, you're very much there in the middle, you could bring people that maybe aren't hunters into this as well to, to educate them. So I, I love that about your organization. Ideally. Yeah. I'd love to bring in, uh, the non hunting public a hundred percent. Obviously we're, we're focused mainly on hunting issues. Yeah. That's what's super important to me. But in the end, as, as far as this big war goes, uh, the war is won and lost with the non hunting public. And that's really what we need to get to. That's what we need to work on. Mm -hmm. First sportsmen need to be organized. They aren't, they are not in this word community. Um, it's honestly, it's funny. You said I've been, I've done this before I have, and it's always different. I, I grow every day. I learn every day. I, I look at, um, where Howl is going. I look at the, honestly, I honestly, thousands of messages that I really can't keep up with anymore of people reaching out, um, for different various reasons. Um, but I think about it, I sit back and I think about where it's going and it was just recently I said, you know, why we are different is because we are building a community. We're not just, um, uh, sort of a, you know, a, a, a bland kind of website that's just putting info out there. We're getting, we are getting people involved and you see that on Instagram, you see, the tags and the people stepping up and giving their testimony and, and commissions and, and tagging their friends like, Hey, thank you for getting me involved in this. And then, and then we, and what I mean, we is, you know, not how, but just the people that are now involved, I think because of how we've, we've certainly been influential in that just kind of, you know, circling around them and, and, you know, cheering them on, you know, great mm -hmm. job, let's do more. And that's, that's what we need to do first. There's so much, uh, divisiveness in, in the hunting community. Um, that's always going to be, that's, you know, it's number one, it's human nature, of course. Right. But I think we can improve on some things, uh, at least in public. Um, we can, uh, you know, put those things, um, we can, we can hide those things from public view because it really doesn't do us any good. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it is community and that's where I think I'm going to focus on yeah, that makes more sense to me. Let's build a community. Um, yeah. and I think that'll be, that's also more, people can relate to that. 
Yeah, of exactly. Course, you right? know, it, it reminds me a lot of uh, something that, so this last weekend we went up to Montana uh, for the Montana Knife Company grand opening. They reopened. Oh, yeah, like, they've been that. open for a while, but they, they yeah. broke ground on a shop a year ago um, and finished it up a couple months ago. And then they brought a bunch of people out to uh, just kind of celebrate their growth. And it was interesting looking around the room and seeing how many different clothing, camo, backpack, like equipment companies there were there. And they're all sharing a beer, drinking together, eating together, conversating, having a blast. No one was fighting. No one was upset. No one was doing, you know, anything contrarian. And I think it's kind of like getting getting into the hunting industry. You see that these companies, yes, they're competing, but it's almost like a sibling rivalry kind of thing where at the end of the day, you love each other, right? You, you're all progressing. You're all pushing each other forward. And I see that kind of going back to what you're saying with the community, what Montana Knife Company has done and brought these people together. You guys are doing something very similar in the hunting community. And again, going back to bringing people in that aren't hunters, that's key. But I also agree that first we got to help ourselves here in our own home and bring all sportsmen together. So what is, what does HOW stand for? What are those initials? It doesn't. It, that oh. was, it, it was because I was working on acronyms, mm -hmm. um, I think we're – it spelled out howl and I was like, Oh, I just spelled out howl. I didn't realize yeah. that. Um, I think I was, I was working on, cause I have these pages. I have a notebook where I have all these ideas or I was just writing stuff down as pages and pages, but it's, uh, I think it was hunters and outdoorsmen for wildlife. And I was like, eh, well, I'm like, I just spelled out howl. That's funny. And then, so hunters and doors for wildlife. And I was like, wait, howl for wildlife. That's, interesting and i liked it because the one thing i learned with the bear ban issue that we got involved in um the messaging i used was protect wildlife um protect black bears um something like that right something to that effect and people don't usually hear that when you hear kind of a a pro hunting stance um and the the anti hunters they co-opt that kind of messaging and they co-opt the imagery of wolves, like somehow that's theirs. And that's always driven me crazy. And, 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 and hunters think the same thing. I mean, now it's definitely different, but for the first year, and especially for the first few months, people saw the imagery of wolves and they were freaked out. Like they'd have a zoom meeting with me with organizations that were kind of partnered with now. And they're asking all these questions. I'm like, guys, listen, you're, you don't like the, you're, you're concerned about the imagery of wolves or how for wildlife or what that means. It's the whole problem. We got to take that messaging back. You know, um, the, the anti hunters have done such a great job, um, at just taking the narrative over. And that's, I think our fault. So there was some, some messaging things there, right? Where I think we need to kind of reverse, um, just switch it up a little bit, how we talk. Um, and not be afraid to, to say we protect wildlife, not to be afraid to say that, you know, hunting actually protects wildlife. Um, but it was also more about the pack. So a wolf pack, and that's essentially who we are. And howling is, it just all made sense to me. It just like, it honestly, throughout all these pages, it was just one of those things where I'm like, ah, this is, I like this, this is what I'm going with. Like it just, it hit me and I didn't even know why yet. I still had to break it now. I just knew that it made sense. Um, but you know, howling is making your voice heard on these issues. There's the pack mentality. There's the imagery plus wolves are pretty cool to make images of. So yeah, the whole thing just, yeah. So it started off, it was an acronym, but not <laughs> it just, I just, <laughs> I ended up spelling out howl on accident. That's, that's, that's really awesome. what it was. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, no, I, I, I love that. And that's a, that's a great message, you know, um, taking back the messaging because you you're right a lot of these organizations use it's it's funny to me because they use predators as the anti-hunting message which that's always been kind of interesting to me as why they use the predator animal for that and not some you know innocent little animal that's like a fawn or something like that you know they choose to use these wolves and portray them as as puppies 
when anyone that's had any kind of interaction with wolves or coyotes or mountain lions or bears know that they're not cute and cuddly. <laughs> they're, they're not the nicest animals out there. Um, and so I think that's really cool that you're looking to kind of hit that head on and, and, and uh, take that messaging back. So with, with how, um, you know, you said you started the change.org petition kind of at the get go. Uh, what are some, what are some, I guess, things that you're addressing? Like you, you kind of shook your head. Obviously you understand about what's going on with the mountain lions here in Utah. Um, mm. what's, what's something that, for example, that being close to home for me, and then we can address some other things that you guys are working on. What are some things that you guys are doing in that situation? Yeah. So, you know, looking back on it now, I wish we would have created a full action on it. I didn't realize how much time I would have had. I didn't even realize it was going, well, nobody knew what was going on. Yeah. I guess. So let's explain this. Are you, are you in Utah? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Interesting. All right. I've been wanting to have a podcast with some people on this whole Utah situation because, um, <clears throat> there are some people who I think they're confused about what it is that I'm saying. I am 100% focused on my disagreement with the process, not the, the idea of hunting mountain lions and not even possibly the idea of maybe Utah needs more mountain lion hunting. I, I'm not sure. I mean, people are certainly telling me that, but my, my problem was the process in which it, this bill started, right? There was a bill HB, uh, what was it? 149. I don't remember the name. Uh, There's so many of them. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I completely forget all that. I have to look at it because there's just so many, my head's just full of bills. Um, but anyways, whatever the bill was, uh, it had some items on it, three or four items on it. It went before the wildlife board. There were sportsmen organizations there and members of the public. I watched all the videos to, to verify, did this really happen? Cause I didn't believe it happened. I had to watch it all. And, uh, those issues were brought up and people spoke on them. No mention of, this wild of the uh mountain lion issue or there was actually i think a there was a trail camera issue that was that was added to it as well i believe um no mention of that it was not in the bill text nothing yeah well so it's basically the uh anyone that has private land can keep their their cameras up year round okay so basically you got money you can keep your cameras up year round if you don't you get to use public land and you can't have a camera up right and that was another issue the previous year before, right? With, with trail cameras. But anyway, um, so then the bill gets to the legislature, the house and the Senate. And at some point in there, uh, a, an amendment to the bill was brought up and I watched the whole thing. It was very short. It was just like, yeah, we have an amendment. Um, we just want to, God, I wish I, you know, I should write this down, but it was, it was like one sentence on what this mountain lion thing was no discussion whatsoever. The legislature, I'm sorry, but your congressmen and your senators, they don't know what the heck's going on with, um, wildlife verbiage or, or, or rules or whatever's going on. They just don't. The guy brought it up. Any questions? Nobody had any questions <laughs> at all. I think there was a question about trail cams. Um, one question. And it was a very kind of simple question that was answered immediately. And then it was voted on and it passed. I mean, that was the process. Now that's not, that's not how we do wildlife. Um, that's not how, we, that's not how, that's not the process for what we should, you know, propose rules or changes or whatnot to any type of hunting regulation. That's, and especially what, what threw me off was in Utah. And this is what throws me off with the people who are, who are, um, uh, they're disagreeing with me. They're saying, well, our wildlife board is, uh, full of special interests and all that. So this was, you know, this is pro, this is pro Utah. This was a good thing that we, that we did it this way. And I'm going, all right, well, then why even have the discussion about the first three or four things that were on the bill? Why not just do this then? But, but you have a pro hunting governor and he signed the bill and the governor appoints the people who are on the wildlife board. So you're not making any sense here. Now, if this was Washington state, I would say, okay, 
I understand what you're saying, but it's not. You guys have a right to hunt in Utah. It's a completely different state. So to have wildlife management go through this process where biologists and scientists and none of the sportsman organizations or public were able to speak on this. It's not like you guys don't have mountain lion hunting there. Right. You have mountain lion hunting. I think there was 35, is it 35 or 2,500 tags issued last year. I can't remember the, the take numbers in of mountain lions. It wasn't a whole lot under a thousand, way under a thousand. Um, so they're, it seems to me like they're aggressively trying to go after the mountain lion issue there. So now what we have, um, and there's a lot that we don't know because this bill just passed. So I don't think it's fair to say what your department of, um, what your DWR is, any oversight that they're going to have over mountain lions is going to be because this just passed. So nobody knows, but what we do know is there's no tags, no separate tag for mountain lions. You just need to have a hunting license, no separate tag. So there's no, it's strange to me because there's no way to know how many people are buying mountain lion tags, no way to reach back out to them. Um, cause they bought a tag and say, were you successful this year? Now, I don't know if there's going to be mandatory reporting. That's going to be strange without tags, uh, hard to manage, I think, um, or voluntary reporting. It just, it's, I can't imagine a biologist that works for Utah that thinks this is a good idea. Maybe I'm yeah. wrong. Maybe there are people who do. It just seems very, uh, strange to me, but again, Besides all that, it's the process of how this bill got through. And that, I think that's just wrong. I just, I do. And I did a little research. So, you know, RMEF and Mule Deer Foundation and um, uh, Sportsmen for Fish and Wildlife, they all made statements that said they, they didn't appreciate, they were against this process as well. And I'll just say this right now. I may be wrong. I might not be, you yeah. know right or wrong. I don't know. I'm just throwing this out there. It's hard for me to believe that any of these organizations that were involved with this bill on the onset didn't know the bill's author was going to do this because yeah. what's his motivation? I, I just, maybe I'm wrong on that. I'll throw that out there and somebody correct me. That's what I'd like to get to. I'd like to talk to those people like, what the heck did you do here? This is not <clears throat> the anti hunting orgs and they already have, they're going to jump all over this. It'll either, I think, feed motivation for another state. They'll use this as an example of why, you know, mountain lion hunting should be banned in this state, that state, whatever. Or I wouldn't be surprised if you saw it on the ballot in Utah because they can raise enough money. They can get enough signatures. It costs a lot of money. And then have something like this on the, on the ballot in Utah to get rid of mountain lion hunting forever you might think that's crazy but believe me that's how they work and they've yeah. already there's already a lot of chatter about that yeah and it's it's really sad because like right now how it's set up with uh coyotes or coyotes however people want to pronounce it um it's basically you take a predator management course and then that's it like there's literally uh right now what what's called a, a bounty but uh, on coyotes right now because they are so rampant and it's almost as though they're they're treating mountain lions the same way, which I and I don't know a hunter that agrees with that. I don't know any that agree with that. Any of my buddies, any anybody that I know, um, any you know people that run dogs, I don't I don't know of anyone that would agree with it. So it's it's interesting to me, just the looking at the political side of things of how they're claiming that they represent our population, but I have literally zero percent of people that I know that are hunters that are for this bill. Like, I got about 2%. That's about okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, oh, there you go. So, you know, but I don't know anyone that, that is, and that blows me mm -hmm. away again, that like we, what you were saying with the process of it, uh, that that is acceptable, that that's okay in their minds, you know, it just well, doesn't make sense. The, and I don't, and I think that 2%, I do think they agree that the process was, was wrong. Um, then they just want to focus on, this is really going to help our mule deer population. Is it really? Um, and again, maybe I'm wrong. I don't, is it really going to help the mule deer population? Because there was already 3,500 tags given. Mm -hmm. Now I get it that now maybe people see mountain lions at random when they're hunting. Doesn't happen a lot. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what state. Yeah. You're in. 
that doesn't happen a lot. It does happen. And now, oh, I saw a mountain lion. I have a hunting license. I don't have a mountain lion tag. Well, you'll now be able to take it. All right. Well, what's, what's that going to amount to? Not much. I did hear that it'll open it up to trapping more. Um, but that has to, again, I don't know the regulations and what this is going to look like. I mean, sure, let's open it up to trapping whatever it was before. I'd like to know what it is going to be now. But that certainly needs to be regulated. Um, yeah. We we definitely don't want to have, and I know the houndsmen know this. They've been making these posts lately. We don't want to have houndsmen out there just taking every mountain lion or taking 10 a day or something, whatever. Yep. Because that's the kind of stuff, and when that happens from one person, one bad apple, that's going to get generalized and painted to all houndsmen, all hunting for for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. And that'll be why you'll see this kind of stuff on the, on the ballot and you're going to see the yep. worst of the worst. So, and we do yeah, need to and, police ourselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, sure. and what's interesting to me too, is, um, I've gone, so I haven't hired any houndsmen myself, but I've been on a bear hunt and a couple of cougar hunts where, uh, and then I've heard about it as well from people that have used these houndsmen. They are pretty particular, at least the ones, and this is how I kind of figured we hired good ones, um, was that they were very particular about what bear or what cougar to take. Like they oh, get yeah. on a track of a bear and then they, they treat it and they're like, oh, that one's really young. We're going to pass. Yep. Um, and then, you know, with cougars, like my buddy hired a houndsman and this houndsman treat seven cougars before he called my buddy and said, hey, we're actually on a mature tom now. And he sent him a picture of each individual and he's like, hey, this one's a tom, but he's he's really young. Hey, this one, you know. And it just kind of went went through seven cougars before he finally said, "Okay, I'm I'm ready. I'm on a track. Come on up here. Let's go for this this one." And uh, you know, it's it's that to me. That's obviously self man. He could have gone after the very first one, right? But his respect for that animal and what they do for for wildlife in general, because predators are needed. You know, we don't need to just eradicate them. Um, and, and like what you were saying, it's just going to take one bad apple to go out there and take every single cougar that he or she goes up, or comes upon um, for this to get completely the pendulum to swing the opposite way to where it's it's completely banned, which would also not be good. Um, yeah. It makes me wonder a little bit how much of the snow that because we've had. I want to say one of the ski resorts got 660 plus inches of snow yeah. this year. And I, someone's going to correct me on this, but I think 200 inches is 100% for us. Mm -hmm. So, like, we are well over what we needed for our snowpack, and that's obviously affecting our elk, our deer, uh, and other wildlife because they can't get the food they need to survive throughout the winter. So I wonder how much of that had an impact on this decision trying to cut down on the impact on our mule deer and elk. I don't know, but just go through the process. You guys are a pro yeah. hunting state, and... I don't, would anybody have a debate about it and come out with the best solution for everybody here? I mean, it's just not the way we can't. And it doesn't matter if anti-hunters have done it this way. Well, if I felt like hunters were as organized and as fine-tuned as anti-hunters, I'd say, okay, maybe you don't have to worry about it. But let's not act around like we're, you know, we're, big guy on the freaking block and we don't have to worry about anything. We're not organized. We don't know what to do when they come out with their big campaigns and their billboards and TV commercials and all this, and all these people show up and then, you know, one of us shows up. Yeah. Well, let's change that stuff first. I mean, let's, this was, this just wasn't a good idea to do it this way. Um, and apparently everybody who was involved agrees with that. Yeah. Even though I think, you know, maybe it will be good for, for Utahns, maybe it will help the mule deer population. Um, but the wrong way to get to that end, I'm not saying you couldn't get to that end through the right process. Just don't use that process. That's, right. it's not good. Exactly. <laughs> not it, good it sets, all. it sets a precedent, you know, a yeah. precedent that we don't necessarily want. And so, yeah. uh, no, I, I definitely understand that portion of it. So what are some other things that you guys are looking at closely right now that you guys are working on? If, uh, you know, for people that maybe aren't aware, because some people aren't, you know, they get their news through social media or whatever, and it maybe gets suppressed or they don't see it. What are some things that you guys are working on right now? So it's always changing. So if you look at our action center, it might go from 20 actions one day um, 
but then if 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 we win those or lose those or if they if they're paused for now or whatever it might go down to five the next day um but big ones that we are working on we're doing a lot in montana uh there's a an amendment to their right to hunt and fish there which basically strengthens that right um and i need to figure out how to word this i am working on this better uh, working on this right now because well let's get let's get through what we're working on first but the right to hunt and fish in montana the amendment is to strengthen that which which adds uh all current methods of take because and i think utah would be a good example um you have a right to hunt in utah but it's just the right to hunt it doesn't necessarily protect uh certain methods of take i believe i i think that's the way it is in utah what montana wants to do is say all right if an organization wants to come in or anaheim groups um come in and they want to work on taking away bow hunting or they want to work on taking away muzzleloader hunting or whatnot, they would not be able to to do, well, they would, but it'd be doubly as hard. They'd need double the amount of signatures to get it on the ballot. The process is just, it's, it's much more protected. And on the right to hunt, it's not like a personal right for the individual. Don't look at it that way where but now I don't need a license and why do I have to pay this if it's a right and I can go anywhere and hunt or it doesn't matter if it's private property. No. It's securing the avenue and the path, the opportunity for the state of Montana to offer that to you. But think about it this way. It's making it harder for those who want to get rid of hunting, fishing, trapping, archery, whatever, much harder for them to get rid of it. We have to look at it from that angle because there has been some d debate as hunting's a privilege, not a right. And hunters are saying this and I'm like, okay, come on, you're right, but this isn't this isn't what this bill is trying to accomplish. And I think for people to say, to fall back on hunting as a privilege and not a right, that's kind of disingenuous. For all of human history, hunting has not been debated. It's been a part of being human. It's been, um, it's a part, it's inherently human, right? Up until what, maybe 40 years ago, 50 years ago, something. Uh, this is very new to, to humans <laughs> to try and get rid of hunting or not eat meat or hunting is unethical or whatever it is. Um, I think we got to look at it from that angle, you know, okay, you're right. It is a privilege and it's still, it still is a privilege to do that. You could, you, if, if you're in Montana and this bill passes, you could still lose your privilege to hunt your right to hunt, whatever it is you want to call it. If you do stupid stuff, you still got to follow the rules, the Montana fish and wildlife uh, the department still sets the rules, still sets the quotas, still does the data and the research to say, yep, there's enough elk here. There's enough meal here, you know, all of that. Um, that's just important to know, I think in that debate, cause there is some debate even with some hunting organizations and we're going to try and answer those questions, um, to get them to change their mind. Um, hopefully, you know, let's have that debate. Anyway, Florida, uh, they are trying to get a, a right to hunt and fish in Florida. Uh, that's a big, that's a big, big bill there that we are helping on. I think we've had, I have to look at it now, but it's 20 odd, some thousand, uh, interactions go through our website on that, on that bill there. Um, Oregon's doing the same thing and they are, it's sort of Oregon's doing it, which they, they should do it, but the opportunity came along because there's a, an initiative in Oregon to essentially get rid of of all hunting, all fishing, you name it, all, all, um, animal agriculture, like breeding and, and all of that. I think it's called IP three. So this was a good opportunity to put the right to food. It actually starts with the right to food, the right to harvest, um, the right to hunt, the right to fish. Um, but it's more centered on the messaging is more the right to food, which I think is what we should do in the future is, yeah make this about a right to food. So we're trying to get that on the ballot in Oregon. Um, so Oregonians can, can vote on that. Um, those are the big, obviously there's the wolf issues going on in, in Colorado, but in multiple States, uh, grizzly bear delisting, uh, that would be for Montana and Wyoming. Currently Idaho would probably fall in next. Um, we've been working a lot with some issues in Canada too. Uh, cause again, state to state and state to 
in country to country, I don't think conservation should have borders. You should, you know, howl across borders, right? I just did a podcast and we were kind of talking about actually Mark Hall. He had the idea. He goes, how about howl, howl across borders? I'm like, yeah, I like it. Sounds great. Let's do it. <laughs> so, um, cause this, this is the North American model of wildlife conservation that mm-hmm. essentially we're, we're defending and talking about here in North America. Right. That's the United States and Canada, but it's the model. And it's the success of that, that we should concentrate on over the last hundred years. There was market hunting, there was unregulated hunting and basically wildlife got wiped out to, to a pretty good extent. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, few players stepped in, created a conservation model. It makes sense to, to hunters and sportsmen because we want to continue to have these species on the landscape and that success has been absolutely tremendous. And the billions and billions of dollars that have come from us um, is a part of that story. And hunting has been a part of that story as a tool in management. Um, That's why we're pro hunting. That's why we're actually pro wildlife. Anti hunting is anti wildlife. Anti hunting is anti human, right? Back to the, I mean, they're trying to take away something that's intrinsically human. It's inherently human. Um, That's what we have to keep in mind here who we're up against. Gotcha. No, that, that definitely makes sense. And, and I agree, you know, getting people to come together is just, it's, it's so difficult for some reason. I don't understand why it is so difficult for people like, yeah, there should be that, you know, people joke all the time, bow hunters, rifle hunters, trappers, you know, how people take things like that should be an in-house kind of joking thing, not genuinely getting upset about, um, you know, how someone takes an animal. Uh, everyone's experience is different. Everyone's, you know, how just the method is just, it's all different. So um, it should be enjoyed and, and we should preserve it. And I like what you're saying about, yeah, technically it may be a privilege, but um, we, you know, and I, I wonder how much of it, cause I I've said that myself because I want people to realize that it is a privilege that if we don't fight for it, it can be whittled away at um, but I also agree with it should be a right. And uh, I just, you know, pulled up the little constitution amendment uh, for Utah. And you're right. It doesn't specifically list out, you know, the different methods of take. It just says, you know, the right to hunt. So, Which is a fantastic, fantastic start. I think there's 23 states that have that Yeah. Um, to some extent. Mm-hmm. Um, adding those methods of take um, definitely strengthens, definitely strengthens that. And, you know, back to the privilege thing, you just, it's a privilege, but it's not up to you. What we're talking about here would be, it's not up to you whether you retain that privilege or not. What you need to understand is there's people who want to come in and through legislation or through essentially lying, let's just bring up trophy hunting, making, you know, um, defining what trophy hunting is to the non-hunting public. And then that's all they know. And they get people on their side and all, now we're all trophy hunters. Meet. Yeah. Meat hunting and all that goes right out the window. doesn't matter. It's not a part of the conversation. We're only doing it for the head. That's where they've, Mm -hmm. they've won that battle so far. They haven't won the war, (laughs) but they've won that battle. So (laughs) what you're allowing in with this whole privilege conversation is them to take away your privilege without you uh, breaking any laws, without you doing anything wrong. So you got to look at it. You really have to look at it like that. That's, that's super important. Um, and it, and it, and it doesn't matter. We have to defend, um, the rights of minorities. We have, you know, I hear all this diversity and inclusion and all, well, hunters are a part of that. We are definitely the minority now, as far as numbers go, you know, percentage of people in a state who hunt, you know, we're a pretty small minority, but when you look at the amount of money, so you look at wildlife, you look at (laughs) conservation, you look at the, the, the money that your department has. How much of that comes from sportsmen? Well, then that's a different story, isn't it? Um, I mean, shoot, just in just because I was looking in, at numbers recently, the total economic impact of sportsmen coming to Montana is over one point one billion dollars per year. Per year. Now that has a lot to do with everything, but a lot to do with non-resident hunters because it's, it's essentially it's tourism. You come in, you go to stores, you go to hotels, you buy this, you buy that, you're, you know, gas, whatever it's tourism. And plus the, you know, the tags are double, triple, whatever it is, a lot more expensive. Um, 
28 million, I think is, is non-resident, just the tags, uh, for hunting is 28 million, uh, resident tags is 10 million. So that it is a tourism industry. Um, whether you like that or not, I mean, that's just the, that's just the, the facts. And yeah. for people who are like, you know, non-residents shouldn't come to our state. Well, then <laughs> you're going to, you then you should 10 times, uh, we should put a 10 X on what you're paying then for the tags. If that's the amount of money that they need for wildlife management. Right. I mean, I don't know all the facts there, but you understand right. what I'm saying. Like we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, you know, there might be some problems and issues with, you know, too many hunters here, too many hunters there or whatever, but that's a different, that's a different story, um, that we can have. But for the purpose of this, we are all of us so important to this issue and to this battle. Um, that's why uniting and, and joining the, this community is so important because then we can, we can kind of speak with one voice and we'll have a lot mm -hmm. of power. If we do that, there's 80 some million sportsmen out there. That is a huge number that would make us yeah. one of the largest, uh, organizations, uh, that represent, you know, hunting, fishing, shooting sports. If all of us were united or a large portion of that, that would make us larger than the humane society or PETA or whoever else it is. That's the crazy, That's crazy. part is we actually have more artillery and, and, and troops, they just haven't been activated. They're over here in the yard <laughs> and then we got a few guys over here fighting the battle and fighting the wars. And I was like, well, hold on a second. All these people are here, you know? Yeah. So when I hear it's kind of the society, they raised millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. Well, the hunting industry, I don't know. They, they do like 5 billion a year. <laughs> I mean, the money's there, you yeah. know, I mean, come on. Let's, let's get the, let's get the wheels rolling here. You know, that's, no, yeah, that's, that's what we're trying to do. That's crazy to think how many people are just kind of sitting back and playing spectator. It's almost yeah. sad. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, cause there's, there are a lot of people that get very passionate and, and will talk or post or, you know, do whatever, but, um, actually getting involved, you know, you mentioned the wolf situation. I laugh about this because technically Utah won't recognize that we have wolves. Mm. And I laugh. I'm like, yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because Idaho has a wolf a problem. <laughs> uh, Wyoming has a problem. Colorado has wolves. So wolves follow borders. Is that yeah. like they, they get to the Utah border and they're like, oh, we're not going to mess with those Mormons over there. So we're going to stay yeah. over here. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think that's how that works. And so especially with where they just re reintroduce I I love that verbiage because there's yeah. been wolves in Colorado, but they're they're reintroducing wolves. Um, yeah, this November it's right there. or December they're going to bring in. Yeah, right. The, and and so that that. <laughs> supposed reintroduction because they haven't yeah. been there um is not going to affect utah like right. that doesn't make sense because where they're where they're putting them is right there yeah. by utah yep. and so we're eventually going to have to address the fact that there's going to be wolves at least on our eastern and northeast borders mm -hmm. uh you know what like how do you get people involved in out-of-state stuff you know, when people are like, oh, that's happening in Colorado. It's not happening here in Utah. What are some ways that people from out of state can get involved in, in things like that? Well, first of all, there is a, there is a, um, this is just one example. There was a collared wolf, um, that was collared in Wyoming and then, um, was found and I think picked up and relocated in New Mexico. So yeah, they don't know borders. They do travel. It, it, it walked around Utah's border. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, uh, it, and, and furthermore, there's a, there is a endangered, the, the Mexican red wolf in New Mexico and Arizona, um, that's classified as a separate species. Those gray wolves that are being introduced, whatever you want to call it, they're going to go to New Mexico and Arizona and completely ruin that entire program because it's no longer a Mexican gray wolf. So all those years, all that data, all that money that was spent right out the door, they're hybrid, mm -hmm. they're hybrid hybridized now anyway uh the the wolf advocates even though i could say hunters are wolf advocates but well whatever you want to call them uh they don't care about that they don't care about that anyway but anyway how do back to your question how do people get involved out of state well 
for the most part, there's only a few actions where we haven't been able to do this. Um, that just depends on who the decision makers are, or maybe what the issue is. All of our actions are set up for everybody to take part in. Now, we, if you are a resident, we want you to um, put that data in to the messages that you're sending. You can, you can edit everything that, that we have there. Um, and if you're not a resident, we want you to put that in there as well. Um, and you brought up Colorado. So why should people, um, out of state that don't live in Colorado, get involved in Colorado issues? Well, uh, for one non-resident hunters make up 55% of CPW's budget. <laughs> so that's a, uh, you have a huge part to play in Colorado's wildlife as a non-resident. So you are investing in essentially your vacations and your hunts and your, and the future of that, right? When you, when you take part. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's the North American model. It's not the Colorado model, right? And if we want to see uh, this successful model continue, then we all need to be on the same side and fight for when there is an issue in this state, in this state, in this state, we all need to get behind that and kind of move around and rove around as a giant pack. We're going to help out Connecticut. We're going to help out Virginia. We're going to help out Florida. You know, um, I think that's, that's super important. You know, if it was a, if we were talking about <laughs> school taxes or something, well, no, why would non-residents get involved? You don't, your, your kids go to school here. They don't go to school there. We are actively participating in all of these states, uh, through hunting or, or fishing or whatnot, and even Canada and wherever else, Africa, all of that. So I think it's important for everybody for sportsmen to be, to have each other's backs. Um, so we set it up and that's what makes us definitely unique is we set it up to where you can get involved across borders. Most actions, um, I won't say all because, may, but I think maybe all, but most other actions that you'll see, they're not set up that way. Uh, and I, I know why I won't get into that, but that's why I set up Hall for Wildlife to, we set it up completely differently on the back end, basically to, to, um, give you the opportunity, uh, to take part in whatever action that's going on around you, um, whether it's in your state or not, uh, you will have, you will have access to that. No, that's awesome. And I love that you guys, uh, you know, set that up because that's something that a lot of people need to understand that is super important. Um, because like what you were saying, most of Colorado, you know, people want to complain about how many hunters are in Colorado. That's fine, but, um, get involved, you know, find ways to get involved. <clears throat> now on your guys' website, you guys post and have all the things that are kind of going on, what you guys are attacking and, and getting after. Is that correct? Yes. And, and it's, so, it's, it's what we can currently, we're very, very small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of other bills out there. There's a lot of other important issues. Um, mm -hmm. and I get so many messages and it's like, you know, Hey, once we're, when we're big and we have a lot of staff, fair enough, we just mm -hmm. can't possibly get to everything right now. And a lot of that also has to do with the way we set up those actions, it takes a long time, multiple, multiple days to set up our actions. Um, mm. because it's very important to understand we're not sending out form letters. We're not sending out canned messages. Each person that comes and, and takes action, they're not sending the same thing out, mm. which has been proven by legislators and in interviews with legislators that when a canned message comes in, it all looks the same. Their staff puts a filter on it. They don't even see it. It goes yep. nowhere if it even gets to the right person, because most of them are set up to not even get to the right people. They're set up to go to your legislator or whatever. It's, it's dictated by your address and where you live and all that. So, mm -hmm. um, we've worked around that and, um, but it's important to not have a canned message and right. important also beyond that, when you see what we have there, that's presented to you, it's a different presentation when somebody else logs in and looks at it. Edit that, add to that, put your own flair on that as well. That even helps. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll be, we're going to be expanding on that too, but that's new stuff to come. Yeah. Well, I guess, yeah, let's talk about that just a little bit here. Um, Cause you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways that people can go in. You can sign a petition, you can uh, send a, like they'll even send you the um, template to send to your legislator, things like that. What yeah. is something different that you guys do 
at mentioning how long it takes to get set up and everything uh, that makes it stand out, makes it actually get to and be effective uh, to our you know representatives. Mm. So depending on how many decision makers there are, so let's just take 10 bills as mm-hmm. an example. Well, let's take three bills to make this simple. Um, one bill might only have, might only go to the governor. So if we would have set up an action for this Utah debacle, it would only went to the governor. Mm -hmm. because the issue was him signing it or not. So that'd have been simple one decision maker. But what we would have done is had on average 80 different variations of emails and subject lines, um, where they interchange constantly. So the same subject line isn't always connected to the same, um, email body. So each time somebody comes, those get interchanged. And then of course, each time somebody comes, that's another variation of it. Now we would have been sending if no editing would have taken place on your part, Mm -hmm. um, 80 different variations of, of emails going to the governor. Now let's go to issue number two and there's 10 decision makers, right? It's on a committee or something. Each time you send in an email, you are sending a separate email to all 10 of those people. Hmm. Right. And the same thing works with the, with the variation of the messages. And then if there's say a full body, there's 150 legislators to reach. It's essentially, you know, when you have an email and you, you have CC and you put in a, everybody else's email addresses, it's like that, but it's going out. They're not on the same email uh, chain. It's a separate email for each person. Right. Wow. Um, but with the same, uh, the, the same variations of, of, of emails, if not more, I mean, we've had, we've had hundreds of them. Uh, so that's what takes a long time is number one, mm-hmm. writing kind of the article and the intro and building the web page, sort of the, the, um, uh, the action part of it, but yeah. on the back end is going through all those emails and adding that. So if you, the user isn't going to take time to write your own message or edit ours, at least it won't be canned. Um, and at least it won't be filtered. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very, very hard to filter, um, on their, on their staff's end. So it makes it much more personal. And what we see um, is you will get, of course, not every time, right? All right. But what you'll see is you will get uh, interactions back from said legislators that aren't canned, that Hmm. aren't just a, you know, thanks for replying. We'll get back with you when you can. Now you are going to get that, but you Hmm. will also get back something really specific to what you just wrote. And that's that's what, that's where we're kind of building that relationship. And then, what happens after that is that person's on their own to go back and forth with that, with that legislator. And that's, that's happened quite a bit. And it's happened even with, um, with members of parliament in Canada where they're interacting with United States citizens. And they're like, why are you concerned mm-hmm. about this? Well, cause I hunt in Canada and this gun amendment that you're trying to pass. I'm a little worried when I get to the border, like, what am I oh, yeah. supposed to do? Or, you know, have you thought about, the impact to your economy if if um if americans are like well man we can't go to to canada anymore and, and hunt with this outfitter because of this and that and we need we have these gun restrictions or whatever other stuff that's going yeah. on in canada that's important for them to understand that's huge for their for their tourist industry hunting industry right. but it's tourism yeah. essentially so look at it from that angle so that's why americans were involved in 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 these uh, canadian issues hmm no, that's really and the cool. same could be said for states, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like that. I, I like that person ability. And, you know, I, um, I can only imagine the, the difficulty of, of setting that up, but I think that's really cool that you guys go through and, and make sure it's not just some spam email that gets sent out. So it gets filtered. Cause I can only imagine working on the staff of legislators like, Oh my goodness. I think my emails are hard to go through. I can only imagine how many emails get sent yeah. out every time there's a new bill for this or something they need to sign or it, man, I can only imagine. So that's cool that you guys make it so personable. Um, that's it's something a, it's else applying that, really... that it's applying that pressure. I mean, I know mm-hmm. they don't read every single one of them because it's impossible. Right. There's, there's seriously been, I mean, sometimes there'll be a hundred thousand emails that were sent, oh, wow. <laughs> right? Because if you have 50, decision makers and each time one person takes action, you're reaching 50 that that adds up. Right. Yeah. So you have a thousand, you have a thousand people (laughs) take action. That's actually means 50,000 actions were taken. Right. Um, so we've amplified, we figured out how to amplify your voice. Um, Mm -hmm. 
but it's just the, it's the pressure that, that builds up. And then, you know, we will, we have the tools and we've used it a few times. Um, but we have the same type of, uh, of idea and, and mechanism for making phone calls and using, um, and make, and tweeting, um, and even sending faxes. So it's like the same, the same mechanism, but it gets to their phones or it gets to their Twitter and you don't have to write anything. All you need is a Twitter account. Um, and it, oh, adds, awesome. it adds everybody that needs to be added. <laughs> and, um, you know, it just, it, it writes out everything for you. It's all automated basically. And that's what we're doing on the back end to make it. So it's just super easy for you to, to get involved. And I've been called out recently by some organizations in Montana, anti-hunting organizations. They're saying, Oh, it's, it's funny. Like we're manipulating legislators and we're using, uh, this one lady, what did she say? Military grade, um, <laughs> emails, no <laughs> strategies or something. I don't know where the oh, heck man. she's getting this stuff, but listen, all it is, is this sportsmen need access to the issues and it's tough to know where that bill currently is and who the current decision makers are, because these bills move. Also, they go through the legislative process. They're in a committee and then they go back to another committee and then they go to a house and then a special committee on the house. So that's what we're doing we're, as it moves. There's always new decision makers. So you might see like part one, part two, part three, part four of a certain action. It starts over each time because now there's no. new people to reach. So all we're doing is saying, here's the issue. Here's the people to contact. Now you're going to wrong me because we made that too efficient. And yeah. they're going absolutely bonkers saying we're, you know, we're manipulating and these people aren't really sending emails or we're making it look like, no, it, these are people who are coming and taking They're action. We've just made it simple because it's never been ever, ever, ever has it been this simple. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And you know, that's something that's really cool because it is, I mean, a lot of these people that are hunters are people that work a nine to five. They don't have all the time in the world to communicate with their, yeah. their yeah. legislature. So the fact that you're making it easier you're breaking down barriers to be able to get that communication out and allowing for editing. If they, if they want to add their own personal touch to it, I think that's please amazing. Do. So, please do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's really, that's really cool. Well, um, where can people go if they want to, you know, they want to add to this, the actions that are taking place that you guys are spending your time, you're putting together and all we have to do is go in and, and help out by sending it, you know, putting our own personal touches to it. How, how do they go yeah. about doing that? Uh, howforwildlife.org. You can join, uh, for free. And what that does is that gives you an account. You don't have to have an account to take any action. So it just, but if you join, that means I can email you with new action alerts. And it's super important to understand if you only want to take action and something that was done in your state, mm. please don't think that way because of this conversation. Yeah. Right. Um, because I don't know when the next time your state's going to have an issue or, or whatnot, but again, we all need to come together here as sportsmen and help out each other state when they need it. Importantly, I, and I didn't do that. That's what the anti hunters are doing. So they'll go from state to state and state and work on campaigns and they see what works. They spend resources in states where they think they have an advantage. So if we come to that state's, um, assistance, right? That's going to make them work harder and spend more resources. And if we can win there, then that makes them less that that makes them second guess. Should I go to this state and do the same thing? Cause that, that is how they work. They're, they're working across borders all the time. We yeah. don't, we don't so well, right? That's what we have to work on. Um, so look at it as if something's going on in Washington and you're in Louisiana, just as an example, that's your battle because at some point down the road, if they continue to be successful, they will be in Louisiana and you'll be fighting it there with a lot less troops on your side. So let's, we're not going to get any more hunters. I don't think. So let's do it now. You know? So anyway, it's uh it's how for wildlife.org. You can sign up for free. That gives you the alerts. Uh, and then we also have a, uh, quite a few different membership packages, um, that are like with our partners. So if you like go hunt, you can, you can get either one of their subscriptions, um, and that go, and then you get a howl for wildlife, uh, membership with that, but it's for the same price that you would buy the subscription on go hunt. So you're not spending any extra money. 
And in fact, Go Hunt's donating 50% of what you spend with them back to us. So it's a, it's a huge win. You get a bunch of different codes uh, to use at Go Hunt also at their store and with Hall for Wildlife. We have an American Bear Foundation membership, which is the same setup. You get basically two for the price of one. Um, uh, Pope and Young, um, and then just the regular Hall for Wildlife membership. That uh, we are a hundred percent donation funded by individuals. <laughs> we don't have, um, not that this won't happen, but um, we're you know we don't do raffles and banquets and and big dinners and you know fundraising stuff like that. I mean, we're I'm way too small to we are way too small to even you know go down that road yet. So all of our funding is from the individual, <laughs> just, awesome. you know, giving five bucks here and 10 bucks there and, and, and all that. And that's honestly keeping just the doors open to like, I have never paid myself yet. Um, a cent, the only people that have been paid, I have two, um, subcontracted, uh, writers who, you know, I'm like, Hey, if I want to get something done in a timely fashion, I got to pay them. They're the mm -hmm. only people that get paid. Um, and it's just based on their, based on their work that they do, you know? Um, so yeah, you can sign up there. And then on Instagram, it's, it's howl underscore org. Um, that's where we, as far as social media goes, that's the only place that I post and it just gets, it's repeated to, uh, you know, broadcasted or whatever to Twitter and, and to Facebook. Um, but it's basically just whatever happens on Instagram. And that's where honestly, this entire campaign from, back to before we were Hal for wildlife, when we worked on the bear thing, it was all, um, uh, marketing or whatever you networking through, through Instagram. That's amazing. Yeah. I'll leave the links down below for anyone here listening that wants to get involved into these important topics, because again, just building that community, uh, you know, putting down your biases or whatever it may be that you've got uh, against other sportsmen, we need to come together and, and make sure that we're not divided. You know, we don't want to be that house divided. We want to be the house that has that strong foundation. I love what Charles is doing here with, you know, what you're doing here with the with Howl and Howl across borders, you know, for Canada as well. We may joke that they're the top hat of the U.S., but in all reality, uh, they what what goes on there definitely affects us here in the U.S. as well. So I highly recommend any of you guys out there listening, uh, if you're wanting to go and take action, definitely check out the links. I'll leave them at the the in the description down below so you guys can go check those out get involved um don't just get wrapped up in what your own state has going on because like what charles said this is something that affects every single one of you whether it's in the future you want to come out and hunt elk mule deer whatever in the west or just in the future having to deal with bands and and, and these uh, other organizations that are anti-hunting coming to your state we don't want that so let's be a house that works together and uh, thanks again so much for your time there, Charles. I, I really do appreciate it. I love what you guys are doing. Uh, we're going to keep pushing that message forward. And, and I, I love the community aspect that you're building here. So thank you so much for that. Thank you very much for having me on. really appreciate it. Of course. All right, guys. And like I always say, get out, live your life, and love it.